What's up, gang? <sighs> Hold on. Sorry about the interruption right there, guys, but it was something important I had to do. But other than that, make sure you guys like and subscribe. Turn on the post notifications for us so we next thing to react to. And other than that, let's get straight into the video. It has been two and a half years since I posted the trailer for my upcoming climate film, as mm -hmm. many of you have noticed. Um, and I have been working on it almost every day ever since. Uh, That's so a lot of really thought. close, and thank you for your patience and stay tuned. In the meantime, I do have something to share for you today. Um, I generally reserve uh, this channel for my own independent projects, but recently I've been working with the folks behind the Nobel Peace Prize, mm. and not only have they been wonderful to work with in terms of support and creative freedom, mm. but they've allowed me to post the video here on my channel. Uh, so thank you to them, and here's the film. Imagine, for a moment, the unimaginable happened. A major city is hit by a nuclear weapon. Now, no number could account for all the devastation that would result. Right. But we can put a number on the deaths. Mm -hmm. At least we can make an educated guess, based on our understanding of what nuclear blasts do to city structures and people. Right. We'll assume the bomb is detonated in the air to maximize the radius of impact, as was done in Japan in 1945. But here we'll use an 800 kiloton warhead, a relatively large bomb in today's arsenals, and a hundred times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So, hold on, my bad pausing right there. So, the Hiroshima bomb blew up midair. It didn't look like it blew up midair from the clips that we saw in history class and stuff like that but it is that to maximize the range that's tough well I kind of understand that because when it goes to the ground it'll just and that it's just gonna affect that area right there but I get it science behind it upon detonation Dang. a fireball as hot as the sun would expand to a radius of 800 meters those near the blast would be vaporized. And within a two kilometer radius, all buildings would likely be destroyed. Now what this looks like, it looks like the, um, I forgot the place though, but that, um, about that firework place, that's, um, shoot, I forgot where, where it was though, but that is just, it looks just like this, like the explosion in the radius and stuff, how it looks like. And we'll assume that virtually no one survives inside this area. You gotta be very lucky to be that two percent. Which, that lives. based on population density, you gotta be would very start lucky the death tally at one hundred and twenty thousand people. I want to make a joke, but I'm not. I'm not. It's about As to be you a move further away from ground zero, estimating deaths becomes more complicated. From as far away as 11 kilometers, the radiant heat from the blast would be strong enough to cause third-degree burns on exposed skin. Dude, even though they're not even that close to it? And as you get closer to the blast, the heat becomes so intense that clothing, even skin, would ignite into flames. That is tough. That said, most people in the city would be indoors or otherwise sheltered from direct exposure. But, still but the very right? structures that offered this protection would then become a cause of injury as mm. debris would rip through buildings and rain down on city streets. That is tough. As a rough estimate, we can assume that half the people between 2 and 11 kilometers from the blast are killed. From that burns, debris, smoke... So just and radiation sickness. So just from one nuclear bomb, you can do that much of a ride from a, a, a large scale damage just like that. That's tough and scary at the same time, man. I wonder if nobody wants World War Three because it, it only takes. It really, it really only takes from this perspective. It really only takes one nuke. I'm gonna be in that gulag. 
which translates roughly into an additional half a million people. That's the Many of these deaths will occur days, even weeks after the attack. Right, because the radiation, radiation sickness stuff. takes about a week to cause death. Mm. Now, much of the dust and ash produced from the explosion will be dangerously radioactive, especially if it originated near ground zero. It's like and the distance the particles low. travel will depend on the wind and, uh, and other factors. Dang it, I forgot the other now, Since this simulation is of an airburst attack, it will produce significantly less radioactive fallout than ground attacks targeting missile silos or bunkers. So we'll go with a relatively small number of deaths outside the 11 kilometer range. That is still tough. If it were a surface blast, the fallout deaths could surpass all other deaths combined, but it's a very difficult number to predict. In theory, radiation deaths can be reduced if people can avoid exposure to the fallout. So basically, so, if you have an underground bunker, you're safe. That's what it is. But it just depends on how long, like, the radiation and stuff would be like that. Because you gotta have, you gotta have, rate, like, a mask. You're definitely gonna need, like, a mask, a filtering mask that can uh, filter out the radiation and stuff like that, and a protective suit. But, um, it's like, you gotta spend, like, millions, uh, probably thousands of dollars to get, like, the well enough equipment and to, to survive and stuff like that because you gotta be eating canned food forever. You gotta have a DVD collection because you might, it, since there's radiation there, cables gonna be out. Uh, you won't get any live TV like that. Probably, probably. I don't know. You know, but uh, it's a lot of stuff that's going into it like this. But um, I'm about to pause it because I know you guys hate hate it when we pause, but it's just like we gotta give our intake, you know, our reaction to it. But uh, let's get straight back into it during the critical first few days. Mm. Fallout shelters were common during the Cold War. But people rarely built it's shelters. Right at the time of Black Ops Cold War coming up. And schools no longer practice nuclear war drills. Facts. We generally talk less. Let me say something. In California, you practice earthquake drills. Even those drills, you can still... You can still die. Because... Even though schools have, like, um, man, I'm just telling you, schools have, a uh, what do you call it, like, 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 foam, like, microfoam type of, uh, ceiling, so you, you can easily touch it and it will fall down, basically like that, so it's not like a whole ceiling, you know, they took the cheap way out, so, like that, so, and under those, like, pipes and stuff, so if that falls down, then the table will break, because the table's not that strong less about surviving a nuclear attack. And in a way, it's good well, that we're and, less afraid of the bomb the hood, now that the Cold War is over. Well, well, when nations are less hood. on edge, the risk of accidents is arguably reduced. Mm. But nuclear weapons remain one of the great threats to humanity. And today, we're entering a new era in nuclear weapon history. Mm. Long-standing nuclear arms treaties are being reassessed, and countries, big and small, face the prospect of new arms races. In part because technology is emerging that may give one side a considerable strategic advantage, hmm. notably hypersonic weapons. Mm -hmm. Current nuclear missiles travel around the Earth at high altitudes, making them visible by radar earlier in their flight. But Some hypersonic vehicles travel close to the Earth, through the atmosphere, at at least five times the speed of sound, mm -hmm. giving defending countries far less time to react. And remember that some of the most perilous moments during the Cold War occurred when countries maneuvered to reduce their opponents' reaction time. And the less time countries have to react, the more likely an accident will occur, or a rash judgment. And then you have smaller nukes that blur the line between conventional and nuclear weapons, providing a more slippery path to nuclear escalation. Now for ordinary citizens, nuclear weapon policy may seem like a complex, even intimidating topic. But leaders often consider public perceptions when making policy, 
In many countries, voter opinion is an important factor. Whether you believe nuclear weapons have made the world safer or more dangerous, both sides generally agree that the bomb brings an unparalleled risk and that there are things we can do to reduce the risk, like minimizing how many countries get the bomb, or scaling back Cold War arsenals, or stabilizing technology races, or pledging to never be the first one to strike. Such ideas have often resulted in signed treaties, some of which have held for decades. Some are at risk of expiring, and some just need a final push to become activated. By being steadfast in these... Oh, that's the tweet of you saying that Russia and the U.S. had to expire in 2021. That's tough. ...his efforts, and not walking away from diplomatic achievements, we can continue the work of ensuring that this nightmare simulation never becomes a reality. You wouldn't want if you'd like to learn about specific policies that could help her but uh, we'll stop right there though um hey that's tough that is tough so one nuke can go out to 11 kilometers m or more that's tough Been your boy Jay, and I'm out. Peace.